morning, Highmark Church. Hope you are enjoying a little bit of the change of the season. You can kind of feel it in the air a little bit, and it's much better than the absolute heat that we've been getting throughout this whole summer, uh, and reminds me of Michigan a little bit more. But uh, I just want to say uh, welcome to Highmark Church, and whether you're sitting here and in person or listening in online, I just want to extend uh, that hand of welcome one more time and uh, just say I uh, hope that you uh, enjoy what we have going on here this morning. And to reiterate what Pastor J.D. was saying, we want this place and we hope this place feels like home for each and every single one of you here For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Corey Sfersina, and I am the youth pastor here at Highmark Church. Um, We'll take it. We'll take it. Uh, And you may see me running around with some of our students uh, and some of our brightest leaders of tomorrow, today, uh, and that's been an absolute blast, but also... uh, I love taking the responsibility and I love having the privilege to speak uh, on a Sunday morning uh, and it's uh, just cool to do ministry in so many different uh, and uh, crazy ways and ways that I never thought that I would be on the stage speaking before you even just a couple years ago. Um, But I'm continuing on with this We Plus Me series that Pastor Don has been preaching on for the past few weeks and uh, it's just been a great time to listen in and and hear about some just foundational and yet very impactful uh, pieces of how we can uh, just enrich our spiritual lives and how prayer isn't a last resort uh, but it is our greatest tool uh, into growing in in our faith and how worship is a foundational piece that we can always come back to uh, as we just uh, encounter this world, but also encounter Christ uh, together. And this morning, I get to talk about a topic that I'm pretty passionate about, and that is the church, specifically how we belong in the church. And I am super excited and super passionate about this because I love the church. I love the church. I remember growing up and always wanting to be uh, at my church because of the way that it made me feel. Uh, I felt safe. Uh, I felt like I could be 100% myself, but ultimately, uh, I was able to experience the love of Christ through its people who really felt like they belonged and in return made me feel like I was a part of that whole story uh, as well. So as I get into it this morning, I just want to start uh, with a question. Uh, Whether you are a visitor here and you have a home church elsewhere or you call Highmark your home, I want to ask you a question, how do you feel? Or how, how, how do you look at Highmark or your home church, and, and what are some things that uh, you experience? Um, is there a sense of ownership? Is there a sense of responsibility or, or a sense that I need to do something for this space that I call my church home? Maybe we can look at it with a little bit of a different perspective between the difference between renting and owning. Now, I'm only 25 years old, um, and I shaved this morning, so I have a little bit of a baby face, so my age is showing. Um, So I haven't had a whole lot of opportunities to go out and rent a car, um, but I've only had two vehicles in my lifetime, and I can kind of follow this path along with it. The first car that I ever had was a 2003 Silver Grand Prix, and uh, let's just say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, um, because... That car was a piece of junk. Uh, I remember being the third owner. It was my dad's, and then my sister's, and then it was me. But hey, it was was basically a free car, so how can you turn that down? But there was rust all around the bottom of the body. Um, The uh, hood had a bunch of scrape marks from a particular sister taking a shovel and getting snow off of the top of it. Wasn't her... Wasn't her greatest moment, but hey, got the snow off, got the job done. Uh, The gas gauge didn't work. It would be at full until it went to empty almost immediately, and you better find your way and get to a gas station very fast because you may be broken down on the side of the road pretty soon. And uh, to top it all off, being from Michigan, you know, we're famous for potholes, um, this car had no shocks. So every speed bump and every pothole that you hit, it felt like the, the whole car was just going to collapse, you know, on itself. Um, but because it was a piece of junk and because it was something that was given to me and I didn't really have any skin in the game with it, I was just driving it as a placeholder. So I was beating it around. I was, you know, maybe not avoiding as many potholes as I should have been avoiding. Uh, and I was just using it to get to my eventual first car, which is that very beautiful and very cool, maybe, 
2015 Dodge Dart that's in the parking lot, and that was the biggest purchase that I've ever made to this date, um, but it had it all. It was beautiful from any eye and any point of view. It had heated seats, so, oh man, in the winter, that's, that's quite nice, and a heated steering wheel. It's got a sunroof. All, everything that you could ever want in a vehicle, it was in it, and I remember taking that next step of ownership, and I remember being a little bit more careful with who I handed the keys to in that car, or, or maybe taking the whole dad response, where are you going? What are you, what are you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when you get there? Where, where are you going to park it? All of these things, and ignore the big paint mark that's out of the bumper. That wasn't my fault. But for the most part, this is a car that I have taken very, very special care of. Um, and when you own something, and when you take ownership of something, you begin to treat it a little bit differently. You begin to see it a little bit differently, and you begin to just care for it in a completely different manner than you would of something that you rented. And I think the same thing can be said for your church community. That sense of ownership that you have for whether it be the people, the space uh, that you, you find yourself in, you begin to see others differently, you begin to treat them differently, and you begin to care for them dif- differently and hopefully for the absolute better. See, the fact of the matter is ownership in the church is an opportunity for change in our community. And how we take ownership of our church is just by getting involved a little bit more. Everything that you see that, uh, that has people stepping up and volunteering is part of their style and taking ownership of their church. But it's not just uh, to fill a role. It's not just to fill uh, a specific need. But no, this is ministry in practical action. Teaching uh, on a Sunday morning in elementary may just seem like a babysitter, but no, that's far from it. It's sharing the love of Christ to maybe uh, God's most precious and, and uh, you know, precious creation. Being a life group leader in youth is not just hanging out with students, but it's, it's discipling leaders of, today, or leaders of tomorrow today so they can be well-equipped to go out into their schools. Or even on a, on a production team with all the lights and all the sounds, it's creating an environment where people can feel like they can comfortably meet and see Jesus. And at the end of the day, that is what the mission of Highmark is, to help people find and follow Jesus. And in return of that, It makes people, whoever they are, visitors, regular attenders, people who call this place their church home, any time that they walk in here, it can make them feel like they belong in this space. So this isn't just something that's specific to Highmark. This isn't just something that's specific for the modern church. This was something that even the early church had to wrestle with uh, and the apostles wrestled with uh, as well. They had all sorts of different people groups coming together for the very first time, and they too had to figure out ways to take ownership. While there was rapid growth, and while there were still some a little bit of of growing pains uh, as they were just figuring out how to do church together. We've been working in the book of Acts for these past two weeks, and we're going to continue with that as well. And in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, this is where our story takes off. And it says, but as believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So like any group of people coming together, there's going to be a little bit of disagreements. It's not going to run so smoothly all of the time, and it's, it's going to cause maybe some frustrations just as you begin to grow together. And that's everywhere because last time I checked, there's no perfect people. And if there's no perfect people, there just in return isn't going to be a perfect church. And, uh, but it's very clear here that we have the workings of an issue uh, in our midst. In the ministry of the church, a group of individuals were being overlooked and causing, as Acts puts it, rumblings of discontent. Now, I I want to point out here and and take a moment, uh, because this is important, with some contextual study, and we're talking about Greeks and and Hebrews that are kind of going at each other. This wasn't wasn't a thing where um, a certain people group was being picked out in the distribution of food, but rather just through some study and some uh, biblical scholars, this was something of uh, the ministry wasn't being run well. And this was the perception of what was happening of a ministry that wasn't being handled very carefully. And so the rumblings and the discontent pop up, and and now, how are we going to handle this? What are we going to do with it? 
You see, because how we handle these rumblings is crucial. If we let these conversations overtake uh, solving the issue at hand or over just overtake the ultimate uh, mission and vision of the church, we will miss out on the grand miracle and the different miracles that we see in the church community every day. See, one of these miracles is the miracle of diversity. And it's very clear, and, and Acts has seen it for probably the first time in history uh, that there are Greeks, there are Jews, there are Gentiles all coming together into one space, into one house, and worshiping the Lord for the first time. That within itself is a miracle. That was unheard of in that period of time, these different cultures coming together and being unified. But the beauty here is that the church is starting to become what heaven will be like someday, where every tribe, every tongue, and every nation will come together and uplift the, the glory and, and praise to Jesus Christ. See, the unity of Christ in which everyone is equal under his grace is the reminder to make sure we solve and hash out our issues and put our dif- differences aside and ultimately glorify him. All of this is to say, and all of this is to point that when we, we fulfill our purpose as the church, when we protect unity. And the disciples are dealing with this uh, in the early church, and uh, disunity, and as silly as it sounds, can come at many different levels of severity, whether it be from something that was really simple that just grew into something big, or a very big issue that the church community needed to come together and solve. See, it's our human nature to, uh, you know, slide into just this attitude of, of grumbling or lack of responsibility or, or even just... Uh, Uh, this frustration with even some of the silliest things that we encounter on an everyday basis. When I was an intern, and I have an example of this, uh, I was an intern just learning how to do some ministry um, before I was the youth pastor here, and uh, I was in charge of the fun. I was in charge of the games and trying to set the tone for the beginning of service and uh, just uh, make sure that kids felt comfortable as they walked into the space. And I remember on a Wednesday night that uh, I just didn't have a game to think of. I had writer's block, and I was struggling to come up with a good idea. So I asked uh, Pastor Alex, who was the youth pastor at the time, for a little bit of help. And I was like, I got nothing. What do you got for me? And he talked about this game with, like, a feather, and he would just, like, throw it and, like, see who could, like, get it the furthest. But his hope was, like, that, like, some big burly kid would come up and try to throw it as far as it and it would just like float and not move anywhere. So he, in his idea, in his mind, he thought this was like a really entertaining game. I did not. I thought it was the worst idea ever, and I, I even said, I'm like, this, is, this game is lame. They're going to make fun of us. They're going to make fun of me, and then no one's ever going to come back to, you know, to remix youth, and we'll be ruined. And he's like, don't worry about it. Like, let's just try it and see how it goes. So reluctantly, we did the game. I explained it, and... Little did I know that it was the most entertaining night of the month. A stupid feather. Who would have thought? But I remember thinking to myself and seeing that this really wasn't an issue in the grand scheme of the things. But I want to look back because I was convicted because my grumblings changed my attitudes of how I served in that moment. See, we have to catch ourselves from slipping into this mindset because it will divert our time. It will divert our energy, and it will divert us from the purpose that God has given to his church, ultimately making a space for the people that can find and follow Jesus. If you let those things slip in and take away from the bigger picture, you'll miss that miracle. But on the flip side, there are going to be times where there are some issues that need to be addressed. And how are we as a church going to respond to them? Are we going to slip into grumblings, or are we going to say to ourselves, How can I help? How can I assist and find a solution? And I want to make it very clear that unity does not mean ignoring issues. It does not mean pushing everything to the side for the sake of something else, but rather it means being committed to solving those issues together. See, in the midst of that, we have our different walks of life. We have that diversity that the the book of Acts talks about, and we've seen even all the way up into the modern church. And we use that diversity uh, to solve issues, to make things better, and to uphold the truths of God's word. See, protecting unity means celebrating that diversity, but ultimately, too, celebrating the one thing that brings us all together. Christ's sacrifice on the cross is the unshakable unity that does that very thing. 
And as we realize that, we begin to see individuals that we brush shoulders with on a daily basis, not as just people, but as God's people, God's children. And as we see those things, and as we realize that these are God's people and they need to be reached, we will be committed to making sure that they are, feel comfortable in that space. They feel like they belong, and they feel like they can find and follow Jesus wherever we're at, wherever Highmark's at, whatever it may be. We will be committed as people to, to make sure that the people experience Christ in his church. See, where are we at with that? If you were honest with yourself and you asked your question, uh, am I somebody who is committed to protecting unity? Am I somebody who is, who is bought in? Because that's what we need to be as a church. We need to be people that are bought in and contribute. And if you ask yourself that question, are you that? Or are you somebody who is simply dating the church and kind of just showing up or on whenever you know, it feels good for you, having that consumer mentality, or are you taking the Grand Prix uh, approach and just using it until it is of no use to you anymore and hoping for a better thing? Or are you going to be somebody who's married to the church? Are you going to be somebody who is married to the people and making sure that you're there for them whenever they need you to be there for them? And are you going to be a person who is going to be involved in making sure that somebody, whoever they are, a stranger or your best friend, experiences Christ in this place. If this is your church home, or if you have a church home somewhere else, be there for her. Constantly show up for her, serve her, and be there every step of the way. See, we fulfill our purpose as a church when we protect unity and we share responsibility. I think it's very clear and very evident that we have to be people that own our church. And that includes owning our responsibility. So like, like I said earlier, it's our nature to blame others and, and kind of take that responsibility away from ourselves. You know, we'll blame coworkers, we'll blame leaders, we'll blame the church as a whole. Um, but in order for the church to succeed in its purpose, it takes members stepping up and sharing in that responsibility. And again, like this, like this theme of this day, this isn't just something for us today, but something that even the apostles struggled with and wrestled with, and something that they understood even from the very beginning. So much so that they called a church meeting. They got everybody together, and they saw that there needed to be something that needed to change, and they had to solve it fast. Our story continues in verse 2 of chapter 6, and it says, So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. And they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God and not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. See, it's very clear that the body of Christ isn't designed for responsibility to just be shared by a few, but for everybody, and that this was understood by the apostles. And they saw that this was something that um, was a ministry of the church, a very important piece, I may add, uh, to what they were trying to do and how they would grow and multiply and create those disciples of all nations. And they took it very seriously. There's a really a lot to unpack in, this, in these two verses of Scripture, but I, I just ask that we look at this closely because we could see the disciples talking about preaching and teaching and, and that being the main priority. But I, I would just ask you to look again. Because they called together the church and they said, we need some of the best, the brightest, the most wise, and the people who are full of the spirit to do this very thing, this responsibility in the church. We want them to take this on because this is a responsibility. And I don't know about you, but when I think of the word responsibility, I don't think of something that you can just push to the side. I don't think of something that is supposed to be an afterthought or something that, ah, we'll get to that later. When I see responsibility, I think of utmost importance and utmost urgency. And this is something that was causing some of those rumblings and causing some of those feelings of discontent. And the apostles knew that we have to get this right because this is going to bring unity to the church, but this is also going to help our church in sharing in the responsibility of it. See, nowhere in Scripture does it say that preaching and uh, teaching uh, is way more important than any other aspect of the church. As, as a matter of fact, it, it kind of equates to the opposite. 
The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, and he, and he talks and, and dissects about how the church is a body. And how uh, every aspect of the church is vastly important to one another. You know, the feet can't go anywhere without the rest of the body. The, the hands can't move. The arms can't flow. And definitely a brain can't do anything if it's just lying on the floor. It takes everybody working together as a unit. And it shows how every single one needs each other in order for the church to function properly. See, it's clear. The church is only as effective to the degree in which it is owned by its people. And do we have people who are sharing in that unity, upholding that, bringing that diversity together to, to ultimately glorify and uphold the vision of what the church is all about? Do we have people that are sharing in that responsibility, seeing how every single piece of everything that is done is a ministry opportunity to reach people? Are we going to be people who are married to the church, and are we going to be people who fulfill those two things of unity and responsibility? So you may be sitting in your seat and thinking to yourself that, you know, how exactly can somebody share in this responsibility? You know, I feel like, I, you know, maybe I could do a little bit more. I feel like, you know, maybe I could do something that would, would help in those practical ministry applications. How can I help? How can I get involved? How can I use the, the great giftings and, and special talents that the Lord has blessed every single person in this room to assist with the mission and vision of the church? And I want to say it's very practical, but very impactful. And it can be broken down into just a few things. And the first thing would to be to just pray for the church. Literally, it's the catch-all and the anything that you can possibly think of when it relates to what we do here at Highmark or the place that you call your church home. Pray for its leaders. Pray for the pastoral staff. Pray for the members and pray for the people that call this their place and their home. And, and pray that the vision and mission of Highmark is seen. But most importantly, pray that everything that we do here, everything that we could possibly imagine of doing and the reason that we do everything that we do is done so that people can find and follow Jesus. Number two is to pray for pure hearts. See, our hearts are the core of everything that we do, whether it be in a spiritual, relational sense or in a, in a secular world sense. Everything that we do is driven by where our heart posture is at. So if we're going to have that as our driving force, then we have to protect it. We have to pray for protection of our hearts, protection from sin, protection from temptation. But ultimately, we have to pray for uh, the hunger as well. The hunger for ministry, the hunger that everybody can have a step in, in, in a place to reach people and, and find and, and experience Christ together. That hunger for missions and... and, and uh, excuse me, that hunger for ministry work uh, ultimately points to God's plan being carried out. And it starts with each and every one of us in our heart posture of where we are at the church. And lastly, and maybe some of the most practical things that we can do is that we can own our role. We have to own our role because there is only so much time that we have here on this, on this earth. The apostles saw that too in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. It continues on. After they had solved this issue, they said, Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. They realized that they can't do everything all at once. They can't do what the church was designed to do if they were taking on all of the responsibility, if they were just doing it on their own because A, it would crush them, but B, there's only so much time to reach and get to people, and we're here to equip other members and other congregants of the, of the church. We want to empower people, and we want to make sure that you are carrying out the, the best plans and purposes that God has for your life. There's only so much time for everyone to do exactly what they were designed to do. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, talks about this as well. For we are God's masterpiece, and he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. This is the cool thing. Everybody has special talents, special gifts, special things that the Lord has given specifically to them. 
We all have a grand purpose and we all have something great that God has planned for each and every one of us specifically. This is a lifetime piece that we can all, you know, hitch our hat onto and, and look back to when times get tough. But this is also very practical for us as we figure out how to navigate and how we serve and how we are coming together as one church. We just have to go out and find where our skills and our giftings work the best. And in a specific high mark focus, there's very practical ways that we can do that very thing. First thing is to either leading or being a part of a life group. Now, I don't know if any of you or you've probably been at kickball this past month. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, who doesn't want to kick a ball as far as they can and run as fast as they can around some bases? And, you know, we'll, we'll learn about some of the rules of, of the game later for maybe some of our more competitive people. But we don't just do kickball to go out and have fun and to see who's the fastest person out on the field. I beat JD. I just want everybody to know that. <laughs> we do this for the community piece. We do this for the camaraderie. We do this for the conversations that happen in the midst of kickball. The, the conversation that could be, oh, this, the Pastor Don's message stuck out to me. This piece was, was really good, and that was something I needed. Or there was this, this part of, uh, of our soap reading that I, it just really spoke to me and, and it was the exact thing that I needed to hear. Or it's just even an opportunity of how can I pray for you? Are you doing okay? Are you doing all right? See, life groups are not just to go out and have fun, although we do, but it's to see that unity, that community in action. And if you want to be a part of that, you want to experience that for yourself, maybe think about you know, taking up an activity that, you know, there's some interest there, or maybe even just think about going to something that um, piques your interest a little bit more. You might never know the best friend that you could make, but you may never know the impact that Christ can have on your life if you don't take that step. Second would be to join a crew. As we see here on a Sunday morning or even on a Wednesday night, there are plenty of opportunities for, for everybody who brushes shoulders with, uh, with the different members and people here to, to serve with one another. And there's plenty of opportunities and plenty of things that have to happen here to do what we need to do, but it's not just to fill a role, it's to do those very things of, of having and showing the love of Christ uh, in a very practical way. Because... Greeters, a part of the hospitality crew, it's not just to open the door for somebody. It's to share in that love and compassion and that inviting nature that Christ has given to each and every single one of us. Being on the production crew isn't just flipping switches and, and having lights go off. It is to create an atmosphere and to, to make people feel comfortable that they can experience Christ and worship him freely. And specifically, in my personal favorite, being a, a life group leader on a Wednesday night isn't just getting to hang out with some awesome students, but it's an opportunity to disciple them and prepare them for the world, but ultimately champion them to reach people in their schools, their communities, and to show that they can do this through Christ. All of these things, and, and everybody has a special gift and special talent that can be used and can be, can be, can be uplifted to be and be a part of that purpose. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, okay, maybe I don't really necessarily know where I fit in. I don't know how I should approach this. I don't know if I could even, you know, serve. Do I even like kids? Um, was, is, is youth an option for me? Well, I, you're in luck. If you are asking all of those questions, if you're thinking to yourself, how do I get involved? Just very shortly, we're going to be having uh, one of our team nights. And it's the very thing that can kind of help you organize those thoughts and, and maybe those wrestlings and just find uh, the best fit for you. And just even in general, it's an opportunity for us to come together and just learn and, and, and be uh, partnered alongside with everybody here so that we can be well-equipped to go out into the, into the world and leading into the third point, into the marketplace, to where everybody has the, the call to make disciples of all nations. And you don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a, a church leader to reach people for Jesus. And it's a very practical way to, to talk about your friends or your coworkers, about your personal story, or about just the impact that Christ has had uh, in your life 
and that they can have that same impact too. All of it being rooted in, in coming together and being consistent here on Sundays so that we can go alongside of you. We can cheer you on and say, you're doing great. You're doing what we were designed to do and we're doing it together. It's an awesome thing when the church comes together and then is able to spread out and go out into the community and reach even more. It's the very thing that, that Christ was talking about as he ascended up to heaven. It was the very thing that he imagined his, his closest friends, his closest followers coming together and then going out and creating that environment, creating that disciple and painting that picture of all the nations of the world coming together. And lastly, and maybe a very practical and a, a huge impact that maybe some of you don't even know is financial giving. You know, it's the above and beyond of the spiritual obedience of tithing. And God has blessed us with resources for us to be generous. And church, I want to say, we've seen that firsthand. We have projects like Kingdom Builders that we've been able to give to over the years. And even just most, not most importantly, but most incredibly, on our first global team to Belize, through the generosity of you, every single student that attended the camp that we were putting on was able to go free of charge. That was because of you. Your generosity, your financial giving. And you may not be able to see that all the time, but just know that every dollar plays a huge impact. And you don't know, you didn't get to see the kids firsthand, and that's a real bummer, I really wish you did. But they got to experience the love of Christ. And they got to through your help. It's an incredible thing to think about because bottom line, all of these things working together, all of these things when we protect unity, when we take responsibility and we come together and meet in this space, when we belong, we become the church. When we take all of these things seriously, when we take all of these things as a priority and a responsibility, that's when things change. It changes everything. And it starts with us in this space. So you may be thinking to yourself, you know, that's great. I get that. I understand. But what about that sense of belonging? What about that, that piece of, of belonging to where, like, when I walk through the door, and maybe I don't necessarily feel the most comfortable. Maybe I don't necessarily feel like I do belong in this space. I said earlier that I love the church, and I loved being around the church. And it wasn't because, like, you know, it was the most fun all the time. It wasn't because it was just this, the, seeing these things and, like, ah, responsibility, unity. But it was those things in action. It was those things being played out. And it was through the people just following and taking and being a part of the church, belonging to the church. It's people like a Jeff Weidman who uh, I had first met when he was an elementary leader uh, at church. And I remember asking him questions and feeling really safe and comfortable with things that I didn't really understand about, uh, about Christ. And I remember that he would always take the time to make sure that anybody who asked him the question of what does Christ look like, how does this relate to me, he was always inviting. He was always there. And it took that step further as when I graduated from elementary, he always was asking me those questions. How are you doing? Where are you at? Do you have any questions? It created a lifelong friendship, but ultimately because it started with him protecting unity, making sure every child felt like they were part of the church, him taking the responsibility, he belonged, and he made me feel like I belonged. It's people like Adana Elias, who is the hospitality guru. Anytime that you would walk through the doors of the church, she would be there with hands up in the air, saying your name, giving you a hug, asking you how your week has been, and say, I've been praying for you, and I hope that you enjoy today. It's simple. It's practical. But it's the passion and love of Christ in full motion. She made sure that every person who walked through the door felt welcomed. And in return, it made them feel like they belonged. And because she belonged, it made me feel like I belonged. It's people like an Alex Kirksey who I got to see firsthand the passion and the commitment it takes for youth ministry. 
And I got to see him work and, and do all these things and this commitment into to making sure that students could be set up for success and set up for uh, a relationship with the Lord. But in return, he shared that same passion and that same commitment to me. Just some late bloomer who's trying to figure out what youth ministry looks like. And he wanted to make sure that every single ounce of energy that he had with his students, he matched with me. Because not only did he want to see them have success in the world, he wanted to see me have success. Seeing that passion, seeing that unity and that responsibility that he took was the first time that I was able to see that in action in that capacity, that close, up and close and personal with a pastoral staff member. He became one of my heroes just through a short period of time of getting to know him, but he made me feel like I belonged. Somebody like an Aaron Halavin who, when I was literally born, newborn baby was there. He prayed over me. He, 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 he championed me. He was cheering me on every step of the way. And it didn't matter if he was youth pastor, associate pastor, lead pastor. He was there for my spiritual development, for me at baseball games when I played. He was all about people. And he wanted to make sure that his people felt like they belonged. And they did. The point I'm trying to get is when all those things are working, all of those things are clicking, all of those things are going together in unison, in unity, and responsibility. You feel it. You sense it. And you cannot escape being a part of it because you will feel absolutely Loved, supported, but at its core, you will feel like you belong. And I hope that's the same, and I hope everybody can experience that. And that's my mission, too. If you don't feel that way, hit me upside the head and say, what are you doing? I'll do better, because that's at the core. We belong. We belong to God. We belong to his church. We belong to his people. As we talk about our commitment to our church community, it really does all start with a, a commitment to Christ. Having a personal relationship with him and asking for forgiveness of our sins. And uh, 